morning. Today is August the 5th, 2015. My name is Nancy Nolan Jones, oral historian for the collection of Reflections of Black Life in Greater Cleveland, 1920 to present. Today we are here interviewing the illustrious George Forbes. Look forward to hearing this interview. Mr. Forbes, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, share your story with us. And we'd like to take you back and just kind of hear about your early life. So if you could give us your place of birth, date of birth, and a little bit about your early life, please. Well, first of all, let me, let me thank you for wanting to talk to me. <laughs> In my age, so many people <laughs> want to talk about me or anything else. I was, I was born in... I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, 1931. I was, the, I was the youngest of nine children. Well, in fact, no, I, I had a sister that lived for a year who was younger than, than I was. And we, were, we were Southerners. We were Southerners. We were poor black Southerners. And when I say that, anything you can think of that's horrible, as far as black people are concerned, we, we experienced that. My father worked as a, in a mill and in the part time we farmed. I picked cotton, I plowed mules, planted corn. But our mother insisted that she had, a, she had a, an eighth grade education, born in Mississippi, Mississippi. but she insisted that we would, would go to school and um, uh, that was that was a must. And when I finished high school, I, I knew that I didn't I didn't I didn't didn't want to live in the South. I, I just didn't want to. And the black women teachers who taught us encouraged us to finish school and to leave because there was there was no future for us in Memphis. So I left and uh, had a brother who lived in Chicago. And that was kind of a tradition in my family. The, the oldest one would leave and go to Chicago and live with my aunt, and he or she would send for the next one in line. So that went all the way down the line. I had a brother who came to Cleveland, and I mentioned it, this is Vic. He came to Cleveland. I went to Chicago for a, a year, and then I came to Cleveland. But each one would send for the other one to come to leave the South. And so I, I, came, I came to Cleveland, Roughly 1953, I came to, no, 51, I wanted to go to school. Didn't have any money. Applied to Bowen Wallace to go to college. But then I was also drafted at the same time. I was drafted in October and then placed in Marine Corps. And when I got out of the Marine Corps in 1953, I came back to Cleveland, and particularly the BW, and I finished there in 1957. So that's, that's roughly the, the, uh, my, my background. Give us your parents' names. My mother, my mother, her name was Elnora Bradley. Uh, my father, that was a maiden name, my father was Cleveland Ford. My father only had one arm. Uh, I, I've never known my father to have two arms. Uh, and he, he lost his arm in this mill that he worked for uh, before I was born. And there was at that time, no compensation for the black people. So what happened is they gave him a lifetime job. So he always worked. And, and my mother, uh, we lived across the street from my, grand, my grandparents. And a lot of times we didn't, we, didn't have, we didn't have anything to eat. But we'd always go to my grandmother's and my grandparents, and they made sure that we were, were taken care of. No money, but a lot of love. Sounds like family was really close. Yeah, and we we had to go to church. We had <laughs> had to go to church not just on Sunday morning, but Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, prayer meeting on Wednesday, choir choir prayer. That was a requirement. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. Was it Baptist? No, it was not my mother. My mother, except my father, he didn't go to church. <laughs> he didn't go to church. <laughs> Oh, how come we can't be like him? <laughs> <laughs> no, but my mother, my mother and my grandmother and grandfather, they founded a small church called 
Princeton Chapel of Yemi Zion Church. Okay. And to this day, when I go south, I go there. Do you? Yeah. Who are you like? You like a little bit of both of them or more temperamental? No, like no, they, they always said that I was like my daddy, but I wanted to be like my mama. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you looked at that, huh? No, I, I want to be like my mama. <laughs> Your temperament was like your dad. Yeah, but I, and I looked like him. He was he was tall, he was the same stature. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he was uneducated, but he was in the end he was okay. All right. Yeah. And so his temperament though, who who ran the household? The mother or the dad? My father was my father was a product of the times of South, black men treated like boys. I can I can remember my father uh, saying yes, sir, to eleven and twelve year old white kids. Okay, I can I can remember that. Uh, and he was a victim of that, uneducated, hard worker, and so he took his frustration out on his family. And it took me some time to understand that. And. He, he was he was a man that was troubled, and as as I grew older and became more educated, I I, I understood it, and I forgave him what he for what he for what he did. And and but but he was my mother's man, and I, I think about this all the time. He was my mother's man. He would he would he would leave home and go, and he would stay, and he would go down and stay on the river. Where we had a farm, we had a farm, and he would stay there in an old shack. And then he'd come back home at times. But he he got sick once. And she went down. No, no, my mother got sick. I was in the Marine Corps. I was a kid. I came home. Uh, and she was sick. It was 1952. And I came home. And he was laying at the foot of her bed. And he stayed there until she got well. And when she got well, he went back down the old shack. Okay? And then at the end of his life, he got sick. And she went and got him. And she brought him and put him in the house. And she took care of him until he died. That's So if, 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 I, if I look and sound complex at times, you can trace it back to that kind of situation. Right. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And it was a different time. It was a different time. You, you, if you have to understand it in the context in which we lived. Okay, black men were not men; they were boys. I can, I can remember in Memphis, the police would kids would be on the corner. You'd have, you have. You don't have any place to go. You go on the corner. You stand up there in front of the drugstore, and they come up and they, they, they say, "Come in, nigga," and they put your head in the in the car, and they roll the window up on it, and they would take off and start driving with you running alongside, and they'd take the club and hit you upside the head. Okay, this is not something that I read. This is something that I experienced and saw. So you, you look at it. The context and 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 the times in which we lived. And this was Memphis, Tennessee, and it's it's not an accident that Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis. It was a tough place. It was a tough, tough place. And so we were encouraged to to leave. To uh, I didn't want to plow a mule. I, I tell the story that when I left Memphis, I left my mule in the field one day, and I see he still might be there waiting for me to come back. <laughs> Done. Okay. Done. Done. But you've done it all. You yeah. plowed. You picked pick cotton. cotton. Pick corn. We did it all. And yet I and yet I I go to Memphis every year just about. I I love it. I I love the. The heritage. I, I love the friends that I had. I love the people. So you connected to 
connected. You're still, Absol you're absolutely. still connected. Absolutely. And I, I talk to my friends once a week, once a, every two weeks. Being the youngest of nine children, was it a, was it a, I, I know that there were hard times, but was there a lot of camaraderie between the siblings? Did, did they kind of point the way for you? Did they model the behavior? No, because, <laughs> no, when, you, when you're poor, <laughs> you're, you're trying to survive. <laughs> And, and we were managed. We were managed, and we were we were programmed by that lady on the wall. She was the force behind it all. She kept it together. Your mother. Yeah, she kept it together. You you sat down for breakfast, and you we we raised our we had a garden across the street. We raised our own vegetables. We had round potatoes, and we had we had pigs and cows and mules in the backyard. So we raised our own meat. Okay, and but she managed it. She managed it, and you you sat down for breakfast, and you and you said your prayers. Okay, oh the the food is blessed. It's a it's a habit. That's something that I got, and I do it until this day. Mm -hmm. I don't eat without blessing. But that came directly from her, and it was it was the training that she she gave us that that we were able to to compete in life. Mm -hmm. So. Taking homemaker to a whole nother level, having those circumstances to keep the family together, and there's no fast food restaurant to go to, there's no grocery store restaurant. You had to understand how to work with the land. You had to understand how to navigate the racism. You had to. So it sounds like she's. Kept well, as soon as, as soon as we got old enough, we individually we would start working. I I worked in a hotel. And I think when I got to be about 13, 14 years old, uh, I was a cook in a, in a hotel, the Peabody Hotel. Uh, it was South Spanish, one of the American restaurants. I cooked there. And when I go to Memphis, when I go to Memphis now, I stay there. I'm getting even. I stay there. <laughs> That's where I stay, okay? <laughs> but we all, we all would give jobs, and we'd work, and we'd bring home, and give our mother money to have take care of the house and take care of each one of us. Okay. But we learned, she taught us that, you know, you, you want to survive here, you got to work, you got to work hard. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. She instilled a lot. Oh, yeah. She was, yeah. She was the backbone. Yeah. So when you talk about, and I do want to talk about your time in the service, you got drafted. How, how was it? How was it in the service? Because when you, when you talk about the, the police brutality then, I mean, we certainly have our stories of police brutality today, and then, you know, going into the service in those times was a difficult. Well, you know, talking about police brutality, that, just, that was just a way of life. That was just a way of life. Uh, I was drafted in the Marine Corps in 1951. I, I went down to the induction center, I was drafted, and and there was five of us. I think it was about two blacks and three whites. I said, well, you five got to go to the Marine Corps. I said, well, no, I want to go to the Army. I said, no, you're going to the Marine Corps. So I didn't want to go there. So we, they sent us to Nashville. And that was where the center was. And I never forget. It was about 12 or 13 of us. And there was two blacks. And I knew that I couldn't go into the restaurant to eat. There was a place where you had to eat. So I knew I couldn't go in the front door. And so it's where you go around the back. So we went into, we went into the kitchen. And they had a table, a kind of a park table. And all the help, they were black. But what, what, what they would do, they, the kitchen help would give us extra food in order to try to make up for the embarrassment, uh, the stigma of racism. And I, and they, we left and we went to Paris Island, South Carolina. And from the time that I got off the train in South Carolina to the time I finished boot camp, I never saw any traces of discrimination on that base. They treated everybody the same and that was bad. 
It was, it, it, it was equally bad, okay? I, I, I will never forget, I, I, I saw, uh, we were doing training for close order drill, left face, right face. And this, this white fellow, the, the, the drill instructor said left face, and he did right face. And the drill instructor come over and knocked him down. I'd never seen a white man knocked down. I said, damn, this is where I belong. Okay. <laughs> Shit, they're going to knock white folks down. <laughs> this is me. Right. And so the, the two years, they, was, they, they didn't tolerate it in service. So it was, it was a unique experience. But I, you know, you, you you lived in the South, and you you knew what was going on, and you wanted to get away from it, and that was the first time I'd ever been really, really been around white people on an equal basis, right? And uh, so I've been well trained for that. So then you got out of the service, and you went to Chicago. No, came back. I came to Cleveland. I went to Baltimore College. Got out of service. I got out of service in October 1953. I went home and stayed a couple of months, and I came to Cleveland in January 1954, and I started college at Bowen Wallace. Now, what inspired you to go to college? Did your mother say? Oh, no, you no, 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 no. I, I knew I could not make it. I, I, could, I did not want to plow a mule. I wasn't going to plow a mule, and I, I could not make it without an education. But our, our teachers in high school had encouraged us to go to school, okay? They had encouraged us. If you want to you want survive in this country, you've got to get an education. So when I, when I got a left service, we had the GI Bill, and it was there for us to go to school. So I came here, and I, I knew that this is where, if I was going to make it, I had to get an education. How was it, how was it at Baldwin Wallace? Was the, the racial makeup at that time? Uh, they had about two, 2,500 kids. I had about 20 blacks. Discrimination? The school? Mm -hmm. No. Great, 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 great school. Great school. Um, they, they, I have an unabiding love for Ball and Wallace in my heart. They made sure that I was, I had enough money to go to school in case of the GI Bill ran short. They would call into the office and make sure there was a loan available for me. Uh, they made sure that uh, I had a job. I, I lived out there for four years, three years. I finished college in three and a half years. I worked out there. They made sure that it was taken care of. Uh, when I when I left politics, I taught ten years out of DW. Okay. Yeah, I taught political science out there for ten years. Mm -hmm. Great school. Great school. Um, so few blacks that they want to make sure that you were taken care of. I went to school when I <laughs> when I got out. I went to school. I was gonna be a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord! <laughs> that was my next question. What was your major gonna be? I said I'm gonna be a preacher. <laughs> and I had a I had a. <laughs> I'm listening up here in the you in the, No, yeah. this is great. <laughs> this is what we want to know. We want to know George Forbes, the person. So you became a preacher, okay? What you, okay, huh? what you want to do? Some of you preacher. <laughs> I just finished two years in Marine Corps, cussing like a sailor. <laughs> so I tell the story that I was walking across campus one day, and my and my uh, my advisor, Ray Strickland, heard me calling for the MLs and all that. He said, "George, you and the Lord ain't on the wrong page." He said, "Y'all, you better." Try to find something else to do, so I went in politics. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, I can cuss at will. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? <laughs> that, is a, that is perfect. <laughs> that was the switch. I didn't know. I didn't know what the hell. I'd be a preacher, right? <laughs> No, but I ended up. I I, I ended up. I got a teacher certificate, and, and I majored in political science. Yeah. I forgot my major. You made the switch. You, yeah. you saw the light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. No, George, you don't, you and the Lord ain't on the wrong same page. You. <laughs> that's good. That's good. So so you you figured out 
figured out that you needed to switch over to political science. And so did they have internships then? Did you study? No, what somebody? happened is that I knew I, had, I, need, I needed a job. I wanted to be able to do something. I, didn't, I, I wasn't, I still wasn't sure. I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a lawyer, but you got to make a living. So I, I got a teacher certificate. Okay, I, I got a secondary uh, education degree and, and a teacher certificate. So when I when I finished college, I I substituted for a while teaching, but I also went to law school. I I, I taught school. Where, where, what school did you teach in? in Cleveland. I, I, I was up. I, oh, okay. I, I, I did a. I think I did about eight months at Collinwood, but I went from place to place. I, sub I, was, I was a substitute teacher. I went to law school, worked at the post office at the same time. Okay. Wow, that's called drive. Same time. That's drive. And uh, then when I, I passed the bar, it kind of, the case was, you know, my, my, it was kind of set what I was going to do. And married, we got married, and we had children, started having children. So I went into went into law, but I also uh, uh, I was interested in politics. And I, my brother and I, we met a fellow by the name of Bill Sweeney, who was a who was a councilman in the Ward 27. I was out there in Superior, St. Clair area, out of 23rd, and uh, we helped him. And then the award was the award was changing. It was, it was Bill was an Irishman. He also was was my insurance man. And then Bill uh, decided that it, the problems of black people were different than the problems that white people had. Black people wanted jobs and those kind of things, and white people didn't want that. They just wanted government. So he decided he wasn't going to run. So I said, "Well, I'll run." And I ran. It was about eight or nine of us. And I won. And what ward was this? Old Ward 27. And that is? Knowledge Ward 9, out at Superior, St. Clair, 123rd, Lakeville, in that area. And it was about, uh, about nine of us. And a lady by the name of Ann Brown, uh, she and I came out of the primary. And Ann was a very nice lady, but Ann was a Republican. I was a Democrat, and I was young, and I had a uh, wife, and, and I had one kid at that time, and, and we figured out a strategy to how to win the election, and she's a very comfortable lady. She, she eventually became the uh, senior citizen advisor uh, with what I've heard. So what we did is that on the polls on election day, and I knew that most black people were Democrats. They gave you a ballot. They said, your choice on election day. George Forbes, Democrat, and Brown, Republican. And the Republicans stuck in their minds. Okay. Because they never said that she was a Republican. We, you, got your, you got me, a Democrat, and Brown, Republican. And I, I won that election. And I was successful in about 11 more yeah, until I left in 1989. Take me back to that time when you won. Um, what was Cleveland like at that time? Well, it was a... Your first, well, your first big assignment, what was on your mind? Well, the first time when I won, it wasn't, at that time, it wasn't the two, two, two important people in the world. At that time, it was me and John F. Kennedy. He had just won, and it was me, right? We was going to rule the world. <coughs> But it was, it was, uh, I had been interviewed and I had campaigned, I'd been downtown. Leo Jackson was in, was in the council at that particular time. And there was a group in Cleveland called the Citizen League. And that was a group of basically white businessmen who, who were hell bent on having good government. And I had just gotten out of college and law school and I believed in good government. Not, not the politics, but just government. Get rid of after our joints and make sure that people were taken care of and you, you, you supported the needs of the community. And that was the kind of thing that we were, we, we, we were about. It was Clarence Gaines, uh, George White, 
myself. Uh, we all ran at the same time and got elected. And so there's kind of a new coalition of, of young black politicians coming. There's about six of us came in at that particular time. And we dealt with the problems of the city of Cleveland as they were. Now this is this is 63, 64. The, the emergence of black power was not yet on the scene, but this was coming. And it was coming like a freight train on a railroad track. And you, you wanted your community to be protected. And, and you demanded good police enforcement and those kind of things. And, and Ralph Logan was the mayor of that particular town. But only emerging was this, this call for, for black unity and for black rights. And, and, uh, and this is something that could not be forestalled when the King was coming on the scene. And so you, you, you saw a switch from good government to black participation, which uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We wanted black participation. We, you had the Huff, the Huff area that uh, black people stacked on top of each other and, and third floors and uh, no court enforcement, those kind of things. And um, that was the rise of Carl Stokes, who at that time was running for state representative, and um, he got elected. And he undoubtedly one of the smartest men I've known, and, and you, you could not beat him in, in the analysis of politics. You just couldn't beat him. He knew where every vote was. And after he had been elected the, uh, to state representative, he decided he wanted to run for mayor. He started his campaign to put together how to get elected mayor of the city of Cleveland County. He knew the numbers, he knew the population numbers, and knew how many white votes he needed in order to get elected. And so I think he ran the first time and he, he, he didn't make it. I tell you, it's, it's a story about the first time that, uh, that, that he ran. And it was something I always regretted. Uh, there was about eight or nine of us about 10 of us, black councilmen, because that time, that time I had 33. And he, he met with us, but he didn't ask us to support him. He, he kind of demanded that we support him. Okay, he never asked us to support him. And you, but you had to know him. You, you really had to, you had to know him, okay? You had to know him. And he knew that that he was black, and there's an opportunity to open up in the country and the black mayor, and that you you better kind of if you don't support me, you'll get defeated. So we didn't support him. And our rationale was he didn't ask. Okay, but you have you have to know Carl, you have to know him. And I always regretted that because I felt that if we had done it, he probably would have liked to got elected the first time around. So, so the next time, and very few people know this. The next time around, he, we all he came, <laughs> he came. I want your help. I want yes, your. Yes, that's And man, you got our help, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that had we done it the first time, it would have happened, but it was just the, the story that very few people know. Did, did you know the, Did you know him out of the political arena? Were you friends with him? We all knew each other. Uh, we, we were lawyers and public officials, so we all knew. And, and you, you knew everybody, right. you you know, and, and everybody, and everybody knew Carl, because mm -hmm. Carl was everywhere. And then Lou, uh, and we, everybody knew each other. But out of that, uh, the next time he ran, the second time, he was overwhelming. He was, he, he knew exactly how many white votes he needed. He knew where he could get them. He knew, and he knew where the pockets were that he could get them. And it came out. I think he won about. A margin about two thousand, two or three thousand. Did Arnold Pinckney run the first election for him? I can't recall. Uh, but he did do the second one, I think. No, Kenny Clements was the Kenny Clements was the on the second election. Arnold Kenny Clements was the campaign manager, and I was the deputy campaign manager the second time around. And Arnold, yeah, Arnold was involved in it for the, 
whatever the titles were. You know, you, you figured out a title where everybody would have their own title. Yeah, but I was involved in the very intricate play. That was an exciting time. Did, would, could you tell there was a major shift in the energy in the city um, when he won? Uh, you, you said it was coming. The integration was coming at you like a freight train. So when it happened, what was the overall feel? What, what was your sense of that? Second coming. We were recognized all over the country. In fact, we had um, with the letter that I read you. I, I remember Dick Hatcher coming to my house and sitting in my backyard, was eating of how to get elected. Uh, I do a campaign in Gary, Indiana. Um, from all over the country, Andrew. I mean, uh, the mayor of Atlanta, Jackson. We went to Case Western Reserve. He came and got his primer from how to do it, put it together, got elected. Everybody came to Cleveland. How do you organize and put it together? And we, we had what was a group that was known as the 21st District Caucus. Jim Rosen, legislator, created a congressional district uh, for, for Cleveland so that a black could get elected. And this was done with primarily through Carl Stokes. And we, 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 and out of that, we formed what was known as the 21st Congressional District Caucus, which is all of the major office holders and uh, politicians, uh, ward leaders. And if you wanted to run for office, or you're black or white, you needed the endorsement of the, of the Congressional Caucus. And if you didn't get it, so. So there was a lot of strategy employed. In Absolutely. That. I mean, it was not. It, it was strategy. I remember Taft was ran for county commissioner, and Stokes supported Taft over the Democrat. Taft got elected, and that's when everybody took a notice. Hey, these guys got something here. This is something that's going on. And it became known throughout the country, and everybody would come in and say, "How do you form this caucus? How do we do it?" Yeah. No, it was it was not an emotional thing. It was it was strategy, and and the and the chief strategist was Carl. Outstanding. You know, to be a thinking person, and to belong, and to sit at the table, and to actually craft out the strategy, and to implement it, and to see it work, had to be. Truly electrifying. Well, that, that's where, and that's where I learned uh, my craft is with with the, the Stokes brothers, and particularly Carl. Uh, and we all, the whole thing was, how do we make it better for black people? That really, that, that, that really was it. How do we make it better for black people? And I, when I got elected president of council, I think it was 71, I'd been in council about eight or nine years. I didn't, I didn't care, I didn't get carried away on the, on the black strategy because I knew that if I was going to get elected, I had to get elected with some white support. But, but I learned in dealing with the business community that, that it's not a problem, it's not a big issue taking care of white people if black people get taken care of in return. Hear me out. Say that one more time. Nothing wrong with taking care of white people if black people are taken care of in return. And that was the deal. That, that, that was the deal with, 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 with the business community. You want to build a building? Got a building built. Give me some. We want some black folks to work on it. And that was that was my because I, you couldn't do it alone with black people. You, it, it didn't work that way. Okay, that, that building there, those buildings. So how you came? They want to build a building. Never forget this, Charlie. They want to build a building. Okay. And the jobs and income tax. Okay, so 
And the building costs $100 million. First, the estimated going to cost $100 million. I said, I want a 20% set aside for black people. Okay, that's what you want. We'll get it. So that's 80. White folks got 80%. 80 okay, blacks got 20%. Well, the building escalated $200 million. Okay? So that means $40 million. But that's the way you, you we got the set aside. So if you don't build the building, white people don't get anything, nor do black people. But if you build the building with the cooperation of white people, everybody makes out. Do you think people understood that about your philosophy? Absolutely. 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 But you, you couldn't be afraid of it. You couldn't be afraid. You put it on the table. Never. Dick Jacobs came to town, and Dick, Dick built it. Society to bank building. And I said, Dick, you got to have some black support. He said, well, George, don't make me hire black folks. It's not going to work. I said, I didn't tell you that. They don't work, you find them. But you give them a shot. So everybody worked, everybody made money, all right? And the town was rebuilt. And that was, that was but, I, but I learned that lesson from dealing with Carl Stokes in the early days when he was putting this thing together for him. For the whole city, and he worked very closely with the business community downtown. Mm -hmm. That's that's clearly a, 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 a stellar strategy. So when you look at politics, then and you look at well. First, let me ask this question: Your upbringing and the deficit of things that you did not have in. in the way you saw black people treated, that was the the foundation of your wanting to make a difference. I, I, listen, I wasn't I wasn't propagandizing for black folks to be in charge of everything. I was I was taking a road that I want black folks to be equal. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I wanted black folks to be equal. Don't don't take everything. If we're gonna build a building, you got eighty percent. Give us ten or twenty percent, because which is, and, and nobody had a problem with that. Nobody had because I, I will never forget we were, we were building a building, and the head of the building trade union. I said, when we built this high building, I said, no, I want want twenty percent. So the head head of the union said, no, I can't do that. I said, what did you say? He said, well, no, I can't do that. I said, okay, then. You'll build that some bitch in Dallas, and you can have all of it. And I walked out of the room. He got the message. Either you give me 20, or they go to Dallas, you can have all of it. But that, it won't be in Cleveland. He got the message. It didn't take a lot of brains to do that. Just common sense. But it took... Guts to stand up can't be to can't that. be scared. Can't be scared now. You can't be scared. Now bear in mind that I am I'm in a council that is predominantly white. I never had more never had more black council than you had white. So I've got always got to go and get that support from the other side. And but I had a, we had a group of people that that we had been together, we understood it. They understood what was fair. They knew I wouldn't act 80%, wanted 20, and they understood that. But in return, what my white colleagues got, they got health centers in their wards, they got playgrounds in their wards, they got the streets paved, everybody. Everybody won. How does that compare to today? I left City Hall in 1989. I've been back three times since then. I don't go there. I, I, I did my penance. I did my, I did my time. I don't have any advice or anybody. They don't call me. I don't call them. So what do you see? I, I, I don't. I, I mean, it's... It's different? Yes, it is. Different times. Different personalities. Do you see as much strategy being employed? No, I don't. No, I don't. More emotional. 
I, I worked with a lady. Her name was Maurice Cardinal. She was the clerk of council. She was an elderly white lady, white hair. And we ate lunch just about every day. And uh, she was almost like my mother uh, as far as politics was concerned. I, some days I want to do crazy things. She says, you can't do that. Says, you can't do that. And she would make sure that. And we shared an office. She, she built an office for me to have my own office. But I knew that in this political arena, you never know what's going to go wrong. But but for 20 years, she and I had the same office. I had a desk and she had a desk. And everything that went on was right there, open to the public. But she made sure that I was stayed within reason. I, I, I remember one day, I, we were talking one day, and I told her that. <laughs> so I, we told her, I said, oh, I don't have any white friends. She said, what did you say? I said, I don't have any white spirit. She said, what about me? I said, well, yeah, you. Okay, you all right. Me and you. She said, well, I'm white. So I said, so. She said, what about Tony? I said, Tony Garofoda, right? She said, well, yeah, Tony's all right. She said, what about Jim Stanton? Well, Jim had been the president of council. I said, yeah. She said, well, you don't have to enjoy it. I don't know of any white, I don't know of any black friends you have. <laughs> I said, okay, we'll stay with that conversation. <laughs> Because you weren't seeing color, you were seeing people. Okay, yeah. You were seeing people yeah. and personalities and who could get the job done. Yeah, but it, it, it goes back to the training that that, that we all experienced in, in the late 60s. I was able to put it together and deal with the business community. And we, re, we, we rebuilt the city. But my, my thing was that if we're going to rebuild, blacks must share. What do you feel like, overall, that's a huge accomplishment, overall, but give me one particular project that you were most proud of. I don't know. I mean, they, they, they came, it was, it was a constant, it was, it was, it was an everyday thing. I was... I talked to a reporter when I left City Hall. He says that that his they had three reporters assigned to City Hall when I was there. And when I left, they pulled them out because there was no news. Every day was every day was a every day was something different. But I, I think the the buildings uh, the buildings that went up downtown. They went up with a with a great degree of black people working on them. Okay? It it, it wasn't it was something that was isolated. It was it was just it was just things were coming. Things were coming. Men would come into this office and we want to build a bill fine. Okay, fine. No question about race. No question about people working in those buildings and the banks and those those the uh, the National City Bank building was I think that was one that turned the corner at Ninth and at Ninth and Euclid when they built it. They used to have little Hanover shoe stores, Flosham shoe stores. Those they wanted to build that and they needed and the leverage that we had. They needed tax abatement. They needed in order to make the numbers work. They needed taxes to be abated for 10, 15 years. We had council members who did not want to pay taxes, but I, I'm looking at jobs. I'm looking at companies, once the building is built, that will come in and start employing people. So we had to pay the taxes. And they made these commitments, and they kept these commitments. And, you know, I would walk downtown, I'd see young black men and women working in those office buildings as employees with decent jobs. And, you know, that you were part of that. When um, I'm looking, you know, did a little tiny research, and uh, Michael White, it seems that you helped to nurture him along. And yeah, Mike was the Mike was the executive assistant to the council. Uh, Mike came to us from Ohio State. He had been when he finished Ohio State, he came and he worked for the council for. Some years and then he ran for council. He ran against Mildred Madison and he defeated her. He came, came into the council. Did 
Did you see his potential early on? Yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was, he was a good man. But as, as president of the council for quite a few years, you have quite a reputation, quite a few things um, that people have assigned to you. Tell me about it. What, 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 are, what are some of them? Uh, I'm looking at this one where he picks up the chair. <laughs> What happened at that one? <laughs> and he just swung, recalls Johnson. And so, you know, I don't know what, it, it was like, um, it was an episode. We were at, we were at Bell's Party Center. Okay. We were, we were having a luncheon, which was not unusual. I mean, you, in order to do strategy, we would, <laughs> so, we went out to Val's and we had a we had a eating lunch and and as usual, you know, we got to arguing about something and and um, Val had Val had just brought in a new chef from New York. Okay, now this is this is the Cleveland leadership. This is the Cleveland City Council members, black council members. We sitting there and we arguing like hell, whatever it's about. And Val Chef came out and was looking at us, and he said, she thought, told me this lady, said, well, who are those people? So she said, she didn't want to tell the man this was the black leadership. She said, well, there's some guys down the street. <laughs> and I don't know what, so Jeff, Jeff said something to me. I can't, I don't recall what it was. Jeff said something to me. And uh, Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, I can't think what it was. And I picked up the chair. And uh, <laughs> well, Jeff was younger than me, right? I ain't gonna let Jeff whoop me. <laughs> <laughs> but I took the chair. What happened is that my bodyguard, the policeman, he stepped between Jeff and the chair. Okay, so instead of the chair hitting Jeff, the chair hit the back of, of the policeman. Do you follow what I'm saying to you? So I do. He see me. He saw me giving us plenty of chairs. So Bill, Bill jumped in and covered Jeff, and he took the he took the brunt of, he took the brunt of the, of the swing on his back. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But you know, people want to take things out of context, and thank you for sharing that with us. But I'm sure. In heated discussions, uh, uh, you know, you you disagree, right? And yeah. then you get emotional. Yeah. You know, you and here I'm making I, your point. I'm taking all this grief from these white folks, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm got all the black. So we got to get this together, right? And, oh, Jeff, no, we can't do that. Okay. It's kind of like your kid when you want to be. Yeah. Your yeah. <laughs> and then by the time we get back downtown, we okay. But Arthur, Arthur told it. It never would have been told. Arthur, won. Arthur Woods told it, right? Did she? Yeah, Arthur told it. <laughs> Jeff didn't tell it. Arthur told it. <laughs> and she was probably laughing. Because <laughs> it says here, Forbes was outspoken particularly on matters of race and the poor. So Absolutely. that's who you championed. You Absolutely. Helped. So. We had, you know, and I'm, 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 and that's what I think that's that's how I want to be remembered that I took care of black folks and poor people it, it's really that was my question yeah we had the federal government used to give us block grant money and quite a bit of money and we would take the block grant money and we would, we would go out for proposals and if you had you wanted some money you would decide how you wanted, you had a group, how you wanted to spend it. And we'd go through it in the city council and the, the council of aides and we'd decide uh, who qualified. We had a lot of food programs in churches. Uh, I remember that the lady had a prison ministry that she would take families down to the prison to, vi to visit their, their relatives. 
and uh, we'd, we'd fund those kind of things. Things that people couldn't normally get money for, but we'd take the block grant money and make sure that those programs were, were funded. And, um, but it was, it was black people and poor people that just never had a shot at it. And that's, 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 that's really, that was my mantra. Yeah. It's how you want to be remembered. Yeah. I, I certainly understand. Um, let's talk about just, this is what I call like the lightning round, Dorothy Miller. Who, who do, you, do you remember Dorothy Miller? Was Dorothy she? Miller, that name is familiar. She was very active in the community. Dorothy, that name is very familiar with me. It's very familiar. Yeah. There, there were people that were on the ground, Harlow Jones. Good, good friend, a good, a good man, a good man. Uh, the day that the riots broke out in, in Lakeview, uh, he and I, uh, you know, I went out, I went out to Lakeview and and I can't, can't recall the name of the street, and we were. What's the fellow's name? That Ahmed was in the backyard with another fellow, and he had his guns. And Halil, we said, "Man, you can't get get." And the police was parked over there. To get, get out of them. And, and so I went down on Huff and got Halil, and we we were trying to talk to Ahmed, but then the, the shooting broke out, and he got he got arrested. He got put in jail. He went to prison. And Judge Batista uh, released him because he, he got a bad deal. He was trying to put out the flames, and they were accusing him of causing it. But he, the flames, yeah, yeah. But he was a good man. Yeah. He was a good man. What, what, what do you remember about those Huff riots? Well, that was in the Glenville. That was the Glenville uprising. Well, you had the, you had the you had the Huff riots, and then you had the Glenville riots. I think the Huff Riot was, was in the yeah, yeah, the Huff Riot was at 70, 71st and, and Huff. I remember that the bar was right there, and they wouldn't let black folks come into the bar. Okay. Is, was that what started it? Yeah. The bar right there, the corner of 71st and uh, either 79th and um, 79th, 79th and, and Huff. They wouldn't let black folks come in there. Black neighborhood. How did you feel your role, and what what did you? What was your role in helping to diffuse all of that? Well, I, rem I remember going up on, uh, being up on Huff. I remember that, and uh, uh, I remember, I remember the Glendale riots. That was, that was in my ward at that particular time. So you you know you go and you try to you try to help you try to you try to diffuse and sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can I remember I remember the Glendo riots. Funny thing, we were Hallel, uh, Pigney, we we're all walking the street, and it's at 105th in Hampton, and here's 105th, and here's row of row of stores on 105th Street. So we then a lady called. She said on the porch, she said, son, to come here, to come here. So we went over there. She said, son, she said, there's a there's a can of gasoline that boy put left there. There were. So we went there and there was a five gallon can of gasoline right next to the lady's house. Because they come back and gonna set the thing on fire. So she said, Holla, she said, come on, Holla. I said, Holla, let's let's put this down there. Let's put this down there. Down the street. He said, no, I'm put this in my car. <laughs> so, so help me, God. No, I ain't got no gas. I'm going to put this in my car. <laughs> Everything is relative, isn't it? Huh? It is. It is. <laughs> no, it is. I'm put it down, sir. Oh, my God. That is funny. That is funny. Isn't that a great story? It is. <laughs> But 
we walked the streets with black preachers and black black leaders. We walked the streets. Carl pulled the police out. He wouldn't let them go in and shoot up people. And uh, we patrolled for a couple of nights and got it together. What about Martin Luther King? Tell me about him. He came to the... the, the um, the year that Carl was elected, he came to Cleveland that summer. Frequently, frequently, he would, I can remember flatbed trucks in the parking lot of Pick and Pay at 100 and, at Lakeview and 123rd and, and, and uh, St. Clair, all over the city, that he would come in and and exhort people to, you know, participate. And he had a group of young preachers that he would bring to town. And they had headquarters all over the city of Cleveland that they would get people to register people to vote. But he would come in and preach from the back of trucks. Uh, he would come to all of that. And that was his headquarters because Odie Hoover had, had been the pastor of all of that. And they would go throughout the city and get people registered reg to vote. Did you find him, to, at that time, did you find him to be the leader that people are? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Having lived in the South, you could understand what he was doing. Do you think you understood better than the Northerners? That, you know, no one has ever asked me that, what you, and, and it's, it has always played on, on my mind. I noticed when I was at City Hall, those of us who was from the South had, had a different take on racial things, but particularly black councilmen. We, we, we wore our Southern problems. We kept them. We, we were always aware of them. They were never, they never left us. You always want, I remember Charlie Carr and I had this conversation before, before about those of us those of us who were black at city council as compared to those blacks who lived in Cleveland had a different take on racial things. Uh, we wore it. We didn't try to lose it. We wanted to resolve it. So I think it gave us a better understanding. And it was, it was not a false understanding. It was real. Okay. Quite a bit of difference. When, when you look at people in general, blacks, specifically in the North. Did they get it? You know, we're, 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 we're having a conversation, and as, as you and I are talking, I'm reflecting, I'm reflecting upon my own personal life. I was born and raised in the church, studied religion in college, very well schooled in it. I'm 83 years old. And if you would have told me, if you would have told me 10, 15 years ago that I would have found personal salvation in a white church, I would have said that you're crazy. With my background, and yet I, I attend basically a white church. And it was, it was a sermon on redemptive love that has kept me there. I, I, I'm at a stage in my life, I don't need to be, I don't need fine brimstone. I don't need to be afraid. I, the preacher preached one, one Sunday and he said, you know, the, the Lord, the Lord won't you just like you are. I said, me? 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 Just me? Me? Won't you just let me? Said, well, you know I do a lot of questions. I said, Lord, I got a place for you, too. I got a place for you, man. You know, come on with me. And I've, I've, I've found that redemptive love thing among a group of white people. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Here is, here is the race man, right? Here is the race man. White folks are crazy. White folks are devils. Here's a race man. And that's why I found a personal salvation. Life is complex. It is. 
So who you were at 18 is not who you were at 30, and it's not who you were at 60. Absolutely. And it's not who you yeah. are at 80. So you, so you have to try to work on this thing. share with your grandchildren when you reflect back on the years and my 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 youngest grandson just left last week he just finished he just finished uh, Morehouse just finished Morehouse and we very we very we we watch he come to the house we watch TV together and, he, and he's a good man and he has a job in in Atlanta, and we sit down. We had a we had a grandfather grandson conversation. A grandfather grandson conversation, and I had no sons, my daughters, and we we had a good conversation. We had a we had a we had a George Forbes. Grandfather, grandson, conversation. So we understood each other. To be a man. Among, among other things, be a man. Be a man. Okay. And they call me G Daddy. I understand. And I was proud to have that conversation with him. I said, I go to church every Sunday. I said, Brandon. Whether you believe or not, folks in church do good things, and you ought to be around people who are doing good things. He understood that. When you hang around them, okay. but it was it was a I didn't need the lecture. We 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 eat together. We go out to eat quite a bit. He and I, you know, we we like to eat at Red Lobster. <laughs> so we we talk. Does he know the the younger? Grandfather George Forbes, he's heard the stories. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, they, yeah, he knows. They know. They've been they've been schooled in it since they were born. And they experienced a, a sliver of it. Yeah. A sliver of it. At one time. You were such a powerful person in this community. You got the job done. You helped to rebuild this city. Well, I didn't. I didn't look at it. You, you, you have to. You have to look at it in the context and the times of when it was going. I didn't look at it as power. That wasn't what it was. It was a. It was my job. It's what I did. It's what I did every day. Do you do you understand? It, it was it's when I le when I left City Hall, I I, I started practicing law. I, I went to court. I, I defended people. I, I protected people. I, I did criminal cases. I did everything. That was my job. The same thing was that I didn't I didn't look at it as power. It was written about, but what was written was not, and it, but you were doing your job. There were there were thirty three of us and it became twenty one of us. And we all we all did our job. We we, we we went to City Hall and we had a piece of legislation and said, Well, you gotta figure out how do you do this? How do how do I get eleven votes? How do I get how do I get eleven votes? Not not they need but eleven. Because once you got eleven you could pass it. How how do I bring everybody aboard? But I knew that I had to I just couldn't get Black folks are white folks. How do we get everybody to join in? So you, you have to figure that out. So do you, you understand what I'm saying to you? I do. So, and that was one of my questions. How did you, as the leader of city council, how did you move the people in the directions that they needed what, to what, move in? I, 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 I had a rule that I... How would I want to be treated in a given situation? How, how, how would I want to be treated? And once you came up with that, the answer to that, 
you knew that you could solve the problem. So you, so you, you, you brought everybody aboard. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't complicated. It was. It, it wasn't complicated. You 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 made it simple. You. It, it, I I never viewed my job as as one of power. It was. It was. You passed the legislation. You you get the votes. You don't you don't piss anybody off. You know you okay. Everybody's welcome on the team. And that's the way that I view it. You're working towards a goal. Always working towards a goal. Do you, well then, seeing you as one of the most powerful people is how somebody on the outside of would have described you. But as you were on But if you dealt with the 21 people down at City Hall, they didn't view it that way. It was one of a team. It was part of a team. How was, how was Wojnowicz? Was he, was he easy to work Absolutely. with? Absolutely. I used to be embarrassed because the papers and reporters would say that I was taking advantage of him. And I would go say, look, George, I'm not trying to, don't worry about it. Just pass the legislation. He wouldn't, he didn't have an ego. He'd present the, the legislation to be, to be passed. I would get the votes. It seems like, it's, it seems to me from what you're sharing with me, it's all about relationships. How you treat someone else, the way you want to be treated, kind of goes back to your foundation that Absolutely. your mother laid, Absolutely. taking you to church. Absolutely. Absolutely. But having the guts to stand for what you believe. But, I, you know, I did some crazy things. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. You know? <laughs> I did, you know. Everybody did. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> we all look back on yeah. sometimes. Yeah. You know, I crazy. You know, I and the radio program didn't help my image any either, you know, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me about, um, tell me about Don King. Tell me about the Colin Post. Donald's, um, what, what, what about it? Is the Colin Post Just ask me, and I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it going to make it? Is it, it, it? Has it turned the corner? We lost a really good leader when we lost Connie Harper. Yeah. The, the she calling, was a hard worker. Yeah, the calling post. Yeah, it, it, it's not going in place. Dun, Dun King is not going to let it go in place. His, that's, his, that's his toy. Okay. He, he made some changes since Connie left, uh, and he's in the process of trying to get it uh, straightened, but it, it's, he brought in a new person here uh, a couple weeks ago, um, but it, it's, it's, it's a pride of, of his, and Connie was a, was a loss. Before Connie, W.O. Walker, Carrie Alexander, that was when it was really a political machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have that kind of a voice today. It was it was working on it was working toward that, but you got to have somebody that's hands on, and you have to have somebody who understands the city. Okay, you have to have somebody who understands the machinations and the maneuvers who can can interpret that, and that it doesn't have. Donald doesn't, Donald is not here, he's in Florida. And W.O. understood it, Harry understood it, but you gotta have people who understand it, how to utilize the paper to the extent that make it, make it relevant to things in the city of Cleveland, that it doesn't have. Um, but you say Don King is, really committed to supporting the paper. Oh, yeah, the paper's not going that place. I mean, well, what, what about that transition with Bustamani and Don King saved the paper, actually, at that point? Was it going down? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was in receivership, and he, he 
thought it out of receivership and then put the country in charge of it. But the, you know, the, the days of W.O. And, and Harriet, they are, they're long gone. Okay. They're long gone. Times have changed. Times have definitely yeah. changed. When, when you say times have changed, that brings me to President Barack Obama. What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Did you think you'd see a black president? Is he doing what you thought he would do? I was in my office eight years ago, and I... I My secretary told me that Senator Obama wanted to talk with me, so I figured she got it wrong, so we, so we called back. Hmm. Said, Senator Obama want to talk to you. So he said, I'll be in town on Tuesday morning, I'll stop by and see you. Okay. So he came. I said, this is in my daughter's office now. And that Tuesday morning, my daughter and my grandkids came down, and their friends came down. <laughs> we sat down and we talked. And she said, why don't you put it down and we'll happen? She said, guys, I'm with you, man. Never thought I would see the day that it would happen. And he brought out, you know, he brought out the worst in some way. Never, he, he brought out the worst in them. You, you've seen so much racism, just so obvious racism. That just, they just can't help it. They just, they just can't help it. And, and sometimes you wonder, man, why don't you tell them people? But he was cool. He kept us. And, and now we begin to understand why. That he's in charge. And the, I, I don't, I don't apologize. I, I told my daughter one day. I said maybe, I, maybe I did it wrong. Maybe I, I was too hard on something. She don't, don't ever apologize for it. You don't have to apologize for racism. That's, you, you have to call it for what it is. Racism is racism, and it is wrong. And I, I spent a lifetime fighting it, and I don't apologize for it. When you talk about racism. Did you, did you have to balance classism in there? Because sometimes black folks can be a handful to I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. So that's not what you call racism, but I guess that's what you would call black classism. Well, you have black folks take advantage of, of <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. The, the problem that the problem that black people have, okay, and it's it's unfortunate, is that fighting racism is a hard, hard job. It it, it wears you down. It it just wears you down, and you have to go somewhere and get refueled and get your tanks charged and your batteries. In. Because here's what ha here's what ha here's what happens to to black people, unlike other problems. The time we spend, the time we spend making sure that people are treated fairly, and making sure that black folks participate in the system on an equal basis. Once we prepare that individual to go out and participate, we lose him or we lose her. Because when they advance, they don't reach back and they don't look back. So the best and the brightest leave and and they don't they don't feel as though they have any obligation to help anybody else. So the battle becomes that much more weary that much more tiresome. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes. So Do you think that has always been or do you think it's more so now? More so now. More so now. 
So once once we re relieve them from the shackles of racism, the next one, the class system comes into effect. They join, they join the, the masses. They join the classes because they are elevated because they have the brains to do it. So instead of instead of leaving and reaching back with your intellect and freeing the folks down here, you join up here in the classes. And you Did integration hurt us then? Everybody didn't leave. But we, we have massive problems. We have massive problems. I know you don't. You do what you can do. Do you like, I know you're a person that loves strategy. Do you think President Obama is really exhibiting um, strategies that are unparalleled? Mrs. Jones, you know that you know that Obama attacks want to call people an MF, okay? But he can't do it. He can't do it. Just for his own personal satisfaction. But he's the president. But he's kind of reached he's kind of reached the point now where they can't do too much to him. Now, my strategy was that I called you that. You pissed me off. That's what I called you, and I didn't give a shit. Yeah. Okay, but he's <laughs> all right. It it, but it'll work itself out. I I tell my daughter sometimes, <laughs> any black person that want to be the president of the United States again, it's got to be crazy. So the way that this man, but this man was, he rose to the occasion. He did. He did. He did. He rose to the occasion. Good man. Good man. Look, I look at how he come out now speaking about the prison population, how unfair it is black folks going to jail. And white folks convince us that that we are the ones that cause the problems. But the whole I spent a life being a lawyer. The whole criminal justice system is designed toward black people. Black folks don't commit all these crimes. They just, I was, I was head of the grand jury. And they bring in from Westlake and Hunting Valley. They bring in black folks. Black folks, black folks don't live out there. All right. I said, do any white folks? Okay, but they bring in black folks. White folks, they go and leave them alone. So you go to the jails. Ninety percent of the folks in jail, black folks. Ninety percent of the folks in jail are there for drugs. Now, they would have us believe that only 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 black folks do drugs. That's crazy. Only black folks get arrested. They don't, arrest, they don't arrest white people for drugs. They arrest black people. So we get caught up in this conundrum. So I, I don't, you can't blame a brother or sister once he get out of the ghetto and he get up. They don't be bothered with this shit no more, man. It's complex, isn't so it? So it leaves, it leaves the fighters. You know, um, I've noticed in this particular recently, this group called Cleveland Eight. Are you familiar with this group of Cleveland Eight? It appears that they're trying to employ a different strategy about going after police brutality, racism. Um, do you think this is the first attempt to do that, or? When I see them organizing as such, it takes me back to the NAACP. That's what the NAACP used to do, is it not? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk about the NAACP. Were you misunderstood there? Was I misunderstood? Mm -hmm. Well, 
I was the president of Michigan, of NAACP, how many years? 20 years. When I left City Hall, I became the president of NAACP. No. It, it takes, it takes us, it takes a special commitment to fight racism. Everybody can't do it, okay? It, 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 it tires you. It takes a special commitment to do it. I didn't view the, the NAACP as a civic job. I didn't need any damn accolades, you know. I viewed it as an organization that had to fight racism in this town that, was, that mistreated black people. And I did that. I raised a lot of money for the organization. Fought it, fought police brutality. Fought everything. But I I grew tired. You can you can I just grew tired. I couldn't do it anymore. And it was time for me to leave. White folks didn't miss you with black folks when I was president of NAACP. So would you say that this Cleveland eight need to align themselves with the NAACP to strengthen that organization, or are they on the right path? Well, I don't want to talk about organizations because people have their own objectives, but it would be great if everybody would get together, okay? It would be great if they all would get together, but people have different objectives. NAACP is not a social organization, it should never be treated that, but even the nationalist is not as strong as it has been. The state chapter isn't as strong. But it, it needs to be supported. You know, in closing, I just have a couple more questions, but it seems to me that what you're saying is after everything is said and done and years and years have passed, racism is still alive and well. Am I hearing that? Amen. Just look at Barack Obama. Ask him about it. Ask him about it. McConnell said that his one job is to make sure that man get out of office. That was his, his soul prayer, make sure this man get out of office. So but we shouldn't, we shouldn't, don't despair. Don't despair. A lot of good soldiers. I, I enjoyed the fight. I, I loved the fight. I was born to fight racism. That's what my mama taught me, that shit, okay? And I don't apologize for it. Do you think, um, who do you, who do you feel that we are passing the baton to? Do you see any upcoming oh, yeah. leadership? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, leadership. Leadership emerges. Okay? It emerges. And it goes in cycles. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the same way it used to be. It, it, it emerges. Shit, you got young kids. They want to, you know, young folks. They'll go at it a different way. Absolutely. But they have to re be reminded to continue okay. to go after it. Absolutely. Well, can you finish these statements for me? What the world needs? <laughs> what does the world need? They have more, more people concerned. Black people need, you know, you, you, you can't sit there and just take it. If you take it, they'll keep putting it on you. Look, now, given your wisdom and maturity, they say what the world needs now is love. No. No. We don't need no love. We need more people concerned. Be about the business. Yeah. yeah. Racism, racism is it's horrible. It's just horrible. It's bad. And you know what? The camera, the, this instant phone, the camera has revealed what has been going on all the time throughout the whole country, okay? This, this didn't just start happening. The cameras, they've been doing that. Yeah, 
communication has okay. really brought the it camera. to the forefront. Everybody got a camera. And they can't deny it. So you got to you got to reinforce, you got to come back strong, you got to get ready for. It. What's your greatest joy? I take pride in, you know, it, it's been a it's been a great life. It's 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 been a good life. And and I never dreamed that a kid from the Methodist Clown and you could be involved in some of the things that I've been. But I but at the end of the day I I take great pride in my daughters and my grandchildren. That was my next question. What makes you happy? So it's family. Yeah. yeah. I, I, my kids never. They, they really. I never talked about what I did at home. I came home and it was a sanctuary. You know, it was, it was a, it was an all-female household. Okay. It was an all-female. There was a lot of love there, and that's why I could go to escape. But I, at the end of the day, I, we we have a great time together. We all we all we get together, and we have a good time, and I enjoy the love that my kids uh, give me. Thank you. It's been a great interview. I appreciate the time. Glad to do it.